Okay, we've had some really exciting debates, well articulated and um, of very good cutting edge recent data and material and uh, I think you'll find that uh, this third debate will also be uh, very exciting as well as we discuss the management of asymptomatic carotid disease, if it ain't broken don't fix it, true or false. And we're going to have uh, two what I consider extremely bright and articulate docs who are to me are like the docs docs, like who people go to in the, in the uh, academic world to try to get some insight and understanding. First is Dr. Simon Chattavetti, who is Professor of Clinical Neurology and Vice Chair of the VA programs for the University of Miami, Miller School of Medicine in Miami. He's been involved in multi-center clinical trials related to carotid artery stenosis for over two decades and was the lead author for the American Academy of Neurology Carotid Endarterectomy Guidelines, and I've had the pleasure of working with him as running the stroke centers together back in, in Detroit. And presenting the false perspective is Dr. Philip Myers, who is the director of the Neuroendovascular Services and professor of radiology and neurological surgery at Columbia University in New York at Presbyterian Hospital and the Neurologic Institute at New York. He is a fellow of the American Heart Association, the American College of Radiology, Society of Interventional Radiology, and the Society of Neurointerventional Surgery. His areas of academic interest include cerebral aneurysms, AVMs, cerebral blood flow regulation, and intracranial and extracranial revascularization therapy. So I wanted to thank Dr. Chattavetti and Myers uh, for coming up to debate this. And um, who's going first? Are you going first? Dr. Chattavetti is going to present uh, his side of the debate uh, first. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, highly appreciative of the invitation to come speak here but I'm a little bit concerned about the conditions of the debate. First of all, you've taken somebody from uh, uh, Florida, South Florida, who's used to 90 degrees and sunshine, and put them in a 60 degree, extremely cold, cloudy day. So not only am I disoriented, but I feel like I'm the one who needs the shark suit. Uh, second, you put a, a humble doctor from a southern state and match them up against a professor from an Ivy League institution. Uh, and then third, uh, with the exception of a couple of people from North Carolina, the audience is all Northeasterners. <laughs> uh, but despite those severe disadvantages, I'm going to give an argument as to why we should leave carotid disease alone and treat it with aggressive medical therapy. Here are the disclosures. Now, my opponent will probably say that carotid revascularization is proven through high-level clinical trials. And I would agree with that, except the high-level clinical trial was done a generation ago. And if you look uh, way uh, down in the corner here, you'll see that the uh, asymptomatic carotid atherosclerosis trial, or ACAS, uh, was published way back in 1995, and actually the trial started in the late 1980s. And so the data that we're relying on is almost uh, 25 to th almost 30 years old in some cases. And, uh, and even this uh, data back in the 1995 had significant problems. Uh, because if you look at how effective it was, uh, many would say that even in 1995, it was of marginal effectiveness. And so this slide shows uh, who are the patients who have the greatest benefit from carotid surgery. And you can see that the patients who have the greatest annual benefit are those with uh, recent symptomatic stenosis. And so those patients uh, had about an 8.5% absolute reduction with stroke. Uh, but if you look at the left-hand side of the slide uh, for eight, oops. Uh, If you look at the left-hand side, uh, for patients who are asymptomatic, uh, the benefit was only about 1% per year. And so that's in the ideal circumstances of a clinical trial where you had the best surgeons, highly select patients, and yet the benefit was only about 1% uh, per year. In addition, there are significant questions about uh, whether some important subgroups benefit. And some of the important subgroups include women and also older patients. If you look at the issue of uh, sex and the benefit of uh, surgery for asymptomatic disease, uh, this slide shows the two largest clinical trials, ACAS and ACST, and you can see that for men, there's about a 50% reduction in stroke, uh, but for women, uh, no clear evidence of benefit from surgery. Another important subgroup, which is ex especially expanding rapidly in the United States, are older patients. And uh, in ACAS, patients above age 79 uh, were excluded from the trial, uh, which is a significant concern. 
uh, and also in the ACST, uh, they had uh, 650 <coughs> patients who were greater than age 75, and no definite benefit was seen in this population. And you can see the comment from the writing committee uh, that in the older patients, because their normal life expectancy is relatively short, any potential benefit is going to be limited. And so why is this such a concern? And uh, here you can see at the bottom the years of the ACST trial. Uh, and you can see that for the first two years, the patients who undergo surgery actually do worse because of the upfront risk of uh, stroke or death. And so you need to live at least two years to break even. And then finally, if you live uh, five years, seven years, 10 years, uh, there could be some modest benefit at about 1% uh, per year. Now, just to uh, emphasize the point that uh, the data that we're relying on is really obsolete, uh, let's look at some other uh, issues. One is the use of statins in previous carotid stenosis trials. And so you can see that in the NASET trial, which was for symptomatic patients, it was around 15%. Uh, but even in our largest asymptomatic trial, the ACST, uh, less than 40% of the patients received statins. And these days, I would argue that uh, virtually all of the patients who are leaving your hospital with carotid stenosis are likely going to be put on high-potency statin medications. And so the question is, why are we relying on data from 1995? And I would contend that we're doing our patients a disservice by relying on obsolete data. Secondly, many of you are probably involved with quality assurance or patient safety task forces at your hospital. And so you also need to scrutinize the issue of are some patients who are undergoing unnecessary procedures, are they being put at increased risk for harms and compromise patient safety? Just to further reinforce the fact that we're relying on obsolete data, these are some events which occurred in 1995. <laughs> and uh, as for all you Red Sox fans out there, I'll point out that Derek Jeter had not even played a f his first full season, and so out of his five world championships, he hadn't won any of his five <laughs> world championships. Now, in terms of medical therapy, we know that in the late 1980s, early 1990s, the world was very different. Uh, there was aspirin monotherapy, very little lipid-lowering therapy use, suboptimal blood pressure control, and in the ACAST trial, there was no organized approach for lifestyle factors such as smoking cessation uh, or exercise. In 2017, we really have a plethora of options, including expanded options for antiplatelet therapy. We have uh, high-potency statins. Uh, for a mere $15,000, we also have PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, we have an improved understanding of blood pressure lowering. Uh, we have the Mediterranean diet, including uh, hummus, fish, olive oil, almonds, all the things that Dr. Myers will be eating tonight. And then we have uh, increased physical activity. And so we really have uh, multifaceted in interventions that we can uh, give to our patients. And so what is the evidence that these uh, uh, interventions are actually having an effect. Well, we know that in patients with carotid disease, high-potency statins can reduce stroke by about 33 uh, percent. With blood pressure control, if we can lower the systolic by 10 millimeters, that would be expected to reduce stroke by 20 to 30 percent. And lifestyle measures such as the Mediterranean diet or increased physical activity uh, can also reduce stroke by about 10 to 40 percent. Uh, recently, Dr. Tanya Turan and colleagues showed that for patients with large vessel atherosclerosis intracranially, those who were most physically active had a 40 percent reduction in stroke. Another uh, evidence uh, that we have is that uh, modern medical therapy is quite effective. And we look, if we look at a related disease of symptomatic intracranial disease, and if we apply the Sampras cocktail, so the Sampras cocktail consisted of four elements, which included uh, antiplatelet therapy, uh, targeted blood pressure reduction, aggressive use of uh, 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 statins to reduce LDL less than 70, and also a formal lifestyle modification program, which encouraged the patients to stop smoking, uh, get off the couch, uh, eat a healthy diet, et cetera. We know that this uh, multifaceted program was very effective. And to Dr. Myers's dismay, uh, medical therapy was actually better than intracranial intervention. And the study was stopped early uh, because aggressive medical therapy was superior to intracranial stenting. And so it seems strange that we would be comfortable uh, treating an 80 percent symptomatic basal stenosis with uh, aggressive medical therapy, uh, but uh, at the same hospital, patients are being told that for your 80 percent asymptomatic carotid stenosis, you should have it operated on. And so I would suggest that if we use all of our, the tools in our toolkit, 
uh, we are going to have a great uh, impact in reducing the risk of stroke in patients with asymptomatic carotid disease. And th we're starting to see the evidence of this, including some studies from Europe, uh, where they uh, have now described in some studies as low as a 0.3 percent annual stroke rate for patients with asymptomatic carotid disease, and so that's going to be very difficult for surgery or stenting to beat. This is from a review from uh, Professor Ross Naylor. Uh, showing that over the last 25 years, the stroke rate has decreased in patients with asymptomatic carotid stenosis, uh, and now in recent years, it looks like it's less than 1 percent per year, possibly 0.5 percent per year. So in terms of what we should be doing, I think we should be supporting new trials, uh, such as CREST-2, which is a NIH-sponsored study looking at modern medical therapy for people with 70 to 99 percent asymptomatic stenosis, and modern medical therapy is going to be compared to and arterectomy or carotid stenting. Uh, this is the primary outcome. And you can see the, uh, that there are two parallel studies, uh, one comparing aggressive medical therapy versus endarterectomy, and the other comparing aggressive medical therapy to carotid stenting. Uh, many of you are participating in the study. If you're not participating in the study, uh, please, on Friday or Saturday night, uh, go to the website, uh, find out what your uh, low closest center is, and please refer your patients with asymptomatic stenosis uh, to the trial. And then finally, I'll say that uh, we also need to consider informed consent, and uh, this was raised in the previous debate, uh, that in 2017, I think to provide optimal informed consent to a patient with asymptomatic stenosis, we need to know how it compares with modern medical therapy and not rely on data which is 25 years old. And to not participate in these new studies would be to simply be, in, a, in the words of one commentator, sad. <laughs> Thank you. Well, he is a tough act to follow. <laughs> but I, I can't disagree with anything he said. I want to thank the meeting or organizers, Drs. Levine, Silver, for inviting me, the NECC uh, AHA team, um, and I appreciate the indulgence of the audience for letting me speak at this late hour, so I'll try to be <laughs> Um, brief as I can. Uh, we participate in CREST II, uh, enrolling surgical candidates into the study and uh, stent candidates uh, into the registry. Well, I realize I'm somewhat of a straw man in this debate. Uh, in this <laughs> audience, I expect that my perspective is not going to represent the uh, perspective of most uh, audience members, and I accept that. And I also recognize that this debate uh, is a contentious one, <laughs> and it has a tendency to become vitriolic. I've seen that at a number of meetings, and I don't think it has to be. I don't, I don't see it as a problem like that. So here's my executive summary uh, of my discussion from the perspective of one arguing in favor of revascularization therapy. There's level one evidence for endarterectomy and uh, stent angioplasty despite a lack of consensus. Uh, carotid revascularization does reduce the risk of stroke. It's been proven repeatedly. Uh, five to 10 percent of the general population uh, have carotid stenosis greater than 50 percent. Eighty percent of strokes are not preceded by symptoms, which is deeply concerning. Strokes caused by asymptomatic carotid stenosis could have been treated. Uh, screening can identify uh, asymptomatic carotid stenosis. And the risks of endarterectomy and uh, stent angioplasty are arguably declining. Uh, the data on declining risk of stroke with medical therapy uh, is flawed from the perspective of a, a combatant in this argument. But here's my thought of what the executive summary ought to say. I believe this is reality, not nihilism. Uh, there is class one evidence for these uh, procedures to reduce stenosis. It's been proven repeatedly both for uh, endarterectomy and a stent angioplasty has been shown to be uh, non-inferior in, in uh, two um, important randomized controlled trials. But the effect size is small. And how small? Well, it depends on the numerator, the appropriate selection of cases for intervention, and it depends on the denominator. How many uh, people do we want to treat in order to prevent uh, strokes? And there's little consensus about the indications for the procedure. This is a $2 billion a year industry as practiced based in part upon scientific guidelines. Uh, most strokes cannot be prevented by endarterectomy. We still don't know how to identify so-called high-risk patients uh, that we often speak about. 
and stroke risk has been declining until recently on medical therapy, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that if there's time. And did I mention this is a $2 billion a year industry? Uh, uh, Robert Hobson, the uh, original principal investigator of the Crest trial, was uh, um, famously quoted to have said in the Wall Street uh, Journal, I, I wish the medical industrial complex wouldn't rush us into this. As with any um, type of medical illness in which industry plays an important role, and we all recognize we're very dependent upon our industry partners for support in our endeavors when financial hopes and aspirations become uh, intermixed with scientific uh, endeavors, it often becomes um, complicated and difficult to sort out. So stroke due to carotid artery disease, stroke, stroke is an important uh, cause of adult disability and death. That's why we're all here today. 20 to 35 percent of strokes are due to carotid disease. Two-thirds of strokes due to carotid thromboembolic uh, disease do not have associated bifurcation stenosis, and only a third of carotid thromboembolic strokes have significant bifurcation stenosis. 20 percent with stenosis have TIA or minor strokes that lead to their uh, um, identification, but 80 percent with stenosis uh, have major strokes with no prior warnings. And 11 percent of major strokes occur due to asymptomatic carotid stenosis. That's about 66,000 strokes per year in the United States. It's nearly uh, half of them are disabling, but it's less than 1 percent of the population over age 50. Well, this is the world I live in. Uh, acute stroke treatment. I'm on call every other night now for 15 years, and we're doing more and more acute stroke interventions, and we're better and better at it. I think we're all aware of the data, and we're proud of it, and it's an opportunity to make a tremendous difference in patients' lives. But uh, no matter how we parse the data and selective we are, there are a lot of patients who don't come out of an acute stroke intervention doing well and uh, this is a, a, a significant burden on our health care system. So waiting until somebody has an acute stroke, there's no guarantee that we're going to fix them. So the goals and limitations of carotid revascularization, we really need to figure out how to identify the so-called high-risk patients. That's patients with 50 to 99 percent stenosis who benefit from endarterectomy and stent angioplasty. They also benefit from aggressive medical therapy. Uh, but it's likely a small subgroup. It's a prob uh, probably a half of 1 percent of the U.S. population and only 0.7 percent of the population over age 50. So uh, in any evaluation of pretest odds when you're dealing with such a small prevalence and in, uh, incidence, it's, it's, it's hard to come up with a test that, and a treatment that's very reliable. So I'm not clear how to identify this group. Tests to identify high-risk patients remain unproven. Best medical therapy remains unproven. And the superiority of best medical therapy over endarterectomy and stent angioplasty also still remains unproven. And it may be costly to identify these high-risk patients. In one uh, UK estimate, it was over $100,000 uh, per stroke prevented, which is a significant uh, issue. I'm not going to go through the data of these trials. I don't think we have time today, but uh, they'll be available in the handout. Uh, but uh, major randomized controlled trials have shown the benefit. So screening, uh, no guideline for carotid screening until 2014, despite widespread, uh, widespread implementation. Uh, carotid ultrasound uh, is the you know, backbone of these screening algorithms, but it's often uh, unreliable. We know in more than 50 percent of cases it's frequently uh, incorrect. Certification helps. It's still highly operator dependent. Stenosis progression occurs quickly. In 50 percent of patients, I see a lot of patients who've progressed very rapidly uh, in the degree of carotid stenosis from something less than 50 percent to 80 percent or more uh, in between short interval screening. Uh, the guidelines support annual surveillance, and uh, the major stroke trials only reduce the risk of stroke by about 50 percent. So if we treat all patients with asymptomatic uh, stenosis, 95 percent of strokes would still occur, and aggressive screening would only reduce the risk uh, of um, uh, the number of strokes by 1 to 2 percent. So we ought to talk a little bit more about the effect size. In the uh, ACST trial, 4.65 percent uh, absolute risk reduction at uh, 10 years, that's 46 percent strokes. Uh, prevented for a thousand endarterectomy procedures in the U.S., there are more than um, 120 endarterectomies or stent angioplasty procedures per year, and this would mean that about 150,000 of them are uh, unnecessary. In the SMART study, 
uh, which I think is an important uh, data set, the risk of vascular death or, MR, uh, or MI was far greater than the risk of uh, stroke from an asymptomatic stenosis. Um, so this was a database of patients without prior ischemia, which is important, and the risk of a stroke was seen as a, a lesser importance than identifying uh, patients for treatment of other causes of uh, vascular death. But let's look again. Uh, the effect size may differ depending on the population we're evaluating. The REACH registry, which I think is also a very important database, was conceived in part based on the premise that randomized controlled uh, trials do not accurately depict disease burden. Uh, the trial-like patient experience differs uh, from trial patient outcomes, and registries offer real-world estimates. And in this kind of an environment, even with patients on what we consider best medical therapy, statins, antihypertensive agents, antithrombotic agents, we still see the, the majority of patients um, in this group suffered uh, a TIA or uh, non-fatal strokes from their carotid stenosis. So I believe that in patients with any evidence of prior ischemia, uh, that we need to uh, really seriously consider revascularization. Uh, temporal trends favor uh, end arterectomy outcomes, but even if the risk were modeled at zero, uh, we still have um, 92 or 93 percent of the procedures are unnecessary. Best medical therapy increases life expectancy, and as uh, uh, Dr. Chaturvedi mentioned, the risk of stroke is declining on best medical therapy, but the decline in stroke uh, reduction has seemed to have stalled, so I don't think we've got the problem licked. I don't think antihypertensives and statins and antithrombotics have solved the problem in a significant portion of our country. Stroke is still a major uh, problem and one that we need to uh, take, take very seriously. There are a number of trials ongoing. Unfortunately, the SPACE trial uh, has been closed for lack of enrollment, and the other trials are ongoing. However, based on our funding cycles, the cost of trials, uh, and randomization, these trials are not enrolling enough patients to reach an 80 percent power ratio. So despite the trials that are ongoing in the real world, it's still going to be hard to resolve this uh, problem. Um, so there are investigational high-risk features. I think in research in this is ongoing and important. And the question is, uh, should we do more trials? And my thought is probably we have to. Uh, identification of true high-risk patients, comparison with devices in high surgical risk asymptomatics, and uh, endarterectomy in patients uh, taking Plavix at the time of treatment and afterward. I'll turn it over for uh, rebuttal. Thank you. Well, if I heard Dr. Myers correctly, he said 115,000 carotid procedures uh, annually are unnecessary. So I'm not sure I need to offer a rebuttal. Maybe I should just declare victory and go home. <laughs> uh, but what are, uh, and he actually previewed some of the, my arguments that I think we need to look at the public health impact. Many of you are involved with your regional stroke prevention systems or your uh, statewide uh, healthcare systems. And so we need to uh, realize that this is a very expensive uh, stroke prevention modality. Uh, and uh, Professor Naylor estimated that in the U.S. there's uh, $2.1 billion in unnecessary expenditure uh, for carotid revascularization for asymptomatic stenosis. And you have to keep in mind that this is coming from a vascular surgeon who's saying this. And so I think it's not really a great use of our uh, stroke prevention dollar. Another concern is uh, Dr. Myers uh, talked about the improving results of uh, carotid endarterectomy, uh, but uh, we also need to know how is it going to play in the real world. And I think this was a very provocative paper from JAMA where they looked at uh, the results of carotid stenting in Medicare patients across the U.S. And uh, in the uh, CREST trial, for example, uh, the perioperative mortality for carotid stenting was about 0.7 percent. Uh, but if you look at the real world, uh, in the U.S., uh, the 30-day mortality following carotid stenting uh, in this population was uh, close to 2 percent, and uh, it was especially higher at uh, low-volume centers. And so we don't really have an organized uh, strategy for this, and uh, anybody can perform uh, carotid stenting at many fa uh, uh, facilities, uh, and many hospitals are not uh, adequately monitoring the complication rates following endarterectomy or stenting. And so in this analysis, 
uh, the periprocedural death rate was 1.9 percent, which is uh, about three times as high as, as high as it was in the CREST study, and this doesn't even include periprocedural stroke. So there's an old saying, uh, will this play in Peoria? And maybe for this audience, we should say, will it play in Pittsfield? <laughs> and, uh, and I would say that there are serious concerns about whether it will be effective in Pittsfield or lots of many other New England communities. And in terms of high-risk asymptomatic patients, I agree that it's worth studying uh, to see uh, who are really the high-risk uh, patients. Uh, some have proposed looking at uh, microemboli on transcranial Doppler, and uh, Dr. David Spence from London, Ontario has been uh, one of the people who studied this issue uh, most intensively. And he's found that with the intensive medical therapy, only less than 5% of the patients have ongoing microemboli. And so if less than 5% of the patients are really high risk, uh, then why does the U.S. healthcare system perform 80 to 85% of revascularization procedures on asymptomatic patients? And we need to come back to the issue once again of, is this a good use of our stroke prevention dollar? And so as I said at the beginning, I'm just a country doctor from the South, and my opponent is a professor from the Ivy League, but I hope that I won the debate. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. It's just, it's so charismatic. <laughs> I just can't compete. Uh, let's see, I had some rebuttal slides. They were sort of partway down the middle of that. Um, we do a lot of revascularization uh, at uh, Columbia University, New York Presbyterian. You know, I think part of this debate begs the question of centralization, which may make sense for a lot of cerebrovascular care. You've heard a little bit about that for acute stroke intervention. Um, that's a, somewhat of a complicated topic, but what about things like brain aneurysms, arteriovenous malformations, carotid stenosis, maybe centers with demon, uh, demonstrable uh, skill sets and experience um, ought to be the places that patients are triaged and when possible, like with asymptomatic disease, shouldn't receive local therapy. I don't know, that's a difficult, um, um, that's a difficult argument. Uh, the meta-analyses, I think, favor endarterectomy over best medical therapy, but not by much. Um, and the r risk of a, a stroke from carotid stenosis uh, a stent procedure has been declining. I think that's with greater experience. There's improved recognition of uh, operator experience uh, in terms of risk reduction, but that's taken a long time to acquire that information, and I believe only six uh, stent uh, physicians met criteria for enrollment in the CREST trial as originally specified. So there are very few people doing enough procedures in the United States to meet the pre-specified requirements for enrollment and trials. That's a problem uh, when it comes to practice because it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't take much to understand that uh, local physicians doing these procedures infrequently aren't necessarily going to perform at um, uh, investigator center <laughs> levels of, of performance. Um, because of the variations in guidelines and interpretations of the data, we see there's dramatic differences in the way even um, countries, as, as groups of people, organizations of people, practice revascularization procedures. And of course, in the United States, where uh, reimbursement remains fairly high for these procedures and um, patients are, are given uh, choices as to whether they undergo the procedures, the United States is right at the top in terms of numbers of procedures performed, whereas in Denmark, uh, based on the same data, the decision is that no patient should have these procedures. So uh, we recognize that in the United States, uh, we perform this procedure fairly frequently, and even up to 20% of the patients in whom the procedures performed have life-limiting conditions and shouldn't have undergone uh, treatment. Uh, the AHA guidelines, again, I'm not going to dwell on them, um, but um, they are fairly clear uh, in terms of the levels of evidence based on all the data available to us. However, when we look at different political organizations and scientific uh, committees, a broad uh, variation in the interpretation. So I think we all recognize this is a very human process, and depending on who serves on the committee and how boisterous they are, uh, the, the social experience uh, determines how data is ultimately interpreted for scientific um, um, 
statements and guidelines. Now, there's an interesting study that I saw, and it comes out of orthopedic literature, and it has to do with the psychology of patients. We're all familiar with Stockholm Syndrome. Well, meeting a patient in the office, I've realized, is not tremendously different. In a sense, they're a captive. And um, I find that uh, what these authors determined is true when I present data to them in an unbiased way. And I usually leave an hour appointment for a new uh, patient evaluation with an asymptomatic carotid stenosis because I know we're going to have to discuss a lot of data. But when I present the data honestly and without bias and I share the entire data set, almost to a person everybody decides they will undergo treatment. So there is a psychology of the individual patient when presented data in an unbiased way, they are usually going to decide to go with the procedure. So that's part of the American culture and the American experience that when given the choice between medical therapy and some form of intervention for their problem, they're generally going to take the intervention, in this case endarterectomy or stin angioplasty. It's not, it doesn't take a sales process. So I think that um, just meeting with patients and going through the data ultimately uh, uh, lands uh, a sale, so to speak. Uh, and with that in mind, I'll conclude. So I think this is an area of uh, ongoing importance for economic reasons. It's a small patient population that we're arguing about, but uh, there are tremendous implications for patient health and uh, medical economics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chetavetti and Dr. Myers, for uh, elucidating this uh, topic, or perhaps the one thing that they seem to agree on is that we do need more trials so that hopefully we'll be able to have this debate again maybe in five years when uh, CREST two is complete, if not sooner. Um, I think that um, it's a question for me is how much difference does it take to make a real difference? And how much should it be and how much is it in reality as to a difference? And I think you've heard very eloquent arguments on both sides as to the, the evidence and uh, the perspective. and coming from both an interventional perspective and a, and a medical perspective, and that's why we have clinical trials like CREST-2, which I think both uh, speakers would endorse and that I personally endorse and believe it's good. But I want to make one comment about the year 1995 um, that Dr. Chad already made. I thought it was a very good year because that was the year the TPA trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and we still use that today, even though you might say that's old trials and old medicine.